So our speaker this evening is Dr. Asa McKercher. Dr. McKercher is Stanley K. Hudson Research Chair in Canada-U.S. Relations and Associate Professor at the Mulroney Institute of Government at St. Francis Xavier University. His books include the recently published Building a Special Relationship, Canada-U.S. Relations in the Eisenhower Era, 1953-1961, and Camelot in Canada, Canadian-American Relations in the Kennedy Era, as well as the edited collections North of America, Canadians in the American Century, 1945 and 61, and Mike's World, Lester B. Pearson, and Canadian External Affairs. He is editor-in-chief of International Journal, Canada's Journal of Global Policy Analysis, Dr. McKercher is a specialist in Canada-U.S. relations, Canadian foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, and North American political and cultural history, and has previously taught at Queen's University, McMaster University, and the Royal Military College of Canada. His talk this evening, Getting into Bed with the Elephant, Canada-U.S. Relations in the Early Cold War, will speak to his extensive work on the subject area and how early Cold War politics between Canada and the United States built the foundation for this relationship as we know it today. Given the ongoing and upcoming political events south of the border and its impact on this relationship, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome this evening's discussion and allow for reflection on how the past shapes the present. We are in good hands this evening. Um, I would now like to welcome Dr. Asa McKercher to the virtual podium for this presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sean, and uh, thanks uh, for everyone there. It's hard to believe there's an election coming in just a few weeks. It's a uh... Tense period. Um, I have a little presentation here, so let me just sort of fire it up if I can. There we go. Okay. Um, so as uh, Sean said, I've uh, published a few books on Canada's relations, uh, which will partly be kind of a, the some of the material I'll cover today. Um, so if you're interested in in this topic, you can check those out with uh, my my newest book, Building a Special Relationship, with my uh, co-author Michael Stevenson. I think he's in in the room somewhere. So that's uh, good to Michael. I'll shout out to you. Um, as I'm a historian, uh, you know, historians like to be historical. So, you know, we're not going to start just with the Cold War. We'll start a few years beforehand. Uh, and that's, of course, with the kind of uneasy relationship that Canadians and Americans have often had throughout our whole history, you know, going back to the War of 1812 and even before that. Um, and certainly, of course, one of the reasons that Canada formed as a country in 1867 was the kind of economic fears of, uh, of kind of American dominance, uh, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the Fenian raids and other kinds of things across the border, fear of American expansion into the West. Um, and so the, you know, so fathers of Confederation came together and formed Canada sort of reluctantly, uh, some of them anyway. Um, and for the next sort of few decades, the kind of fear and concern, uh, but also attraction of the United States was something that certainly loomed uh, in the minds of many Canadians, as you can see sort of pictured here in these two very uh, similar uh, editorial cartoons uh, made 60 years apart, the, the first one there from the 1870s and the next one there from the 1930s. You know, Little Miss Canada, um, more on that kind of swarthy, leering uh, Uncle Sam out to out to, uh, to whisker away from, from Mother England. Um, so that kind of uneasiness obviously was reflected too um, in you know, perhaps real fears uh, or maybe some imagined kind of fears of an American invasion. And so, you know, some of you might know um, that Canada had this, what, what seems in retrospect, kind of a harebrained scheme that in the event of a war um, between the United States and Britain, Canadians' uh, forces, uh, of which there were very few in 1921, uh, could, you know, march across the border and see some sort of border towns to to help uh, you know, hold hold the fort down until the Royal Navy could come uh, say, uh, 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 rid, rid us of the American threat. Um, and Americans had their own sort of war plans uh, for invasion of Canada. Now, how seriously uh, these war plans were, uh, it was a matter of sort of historical debate, uh, but certainly, you know, there, there are probably war plans today uh, in National Defense Headquarters and Carling Avenue, uh, some other places uh, for a potential war. I mean, again, how serious these, these things are, um, who knows, but uh, you know, the, lot, the lot of military people is to prepare for the unthinkable sort of things. Um, but certainly from Canadian politicians in the 1920s and 1930s, it seems inconceivable that Canada would go to war with the United States, uh, in part because, of course, the Great Depression meant that uh, our, our prime ministers in the 1930s, R.B. Bennett and William Lyme Mackenzie King, had far greater things to do and uh, focus on than, than the, perhaps the military threat of the United States. But that kind of backwards kind of threat of, of America is certainly a part of the Canadian psyche. It's a part, obviously, of Canadian nationalism, uh, there's kind of an anti-American strain. But the wider kind of trend... Um, which we see, you know, take place over the course of the 20th century uh, into the into the present, um, is what political scientists have sort of called the sort of development of a democratic peace in North America. The, the, the a very idea that warfare between Canada and the United States becomes unthinkable, and it becomes unthinkable sometime in the 1930s or 1940s. 
Um, and a second kind of thing that we can borrow from our friends in political science, um, the, the so-called idea of complex interdependence, an idea sort of advanced by two American political scientists, Robert Keohane and Joseph Nye, the idea that there's so much interchange between Canada and the United States, the state, the two, the two state entities, but also at kind of the personal individual level between Canadians and Americans who travel across the border, who have family across the border, who maybe work across the border, have investments across the border, um, that just the kind of overt hostility is so just impossible and improbable to conceive of. So, we, you know, our political friends and political scientists have kind of advanced some of these ideas. And we can certainly see evidence of this in the kind of historical record, obviously, which is what, as historians we sort of care about. Um, and certainly that idea of warfare becoming unthinkable is really commemorated in a series of kind of memorials um, built uh, at the end of the, the First World War um, and into the 1920s, commemorating a century of peace between Canadians and Americans. There were supposed to be far more celebrations uh, to commemorate the end of the War of 1812 in 1915, but there was a thing called the Great War going on, so Canadians had little time to celebrate that. Uh, so it was after the war that a whole series of, of sort of uh, celebratory uh, memorials like this one um, between Blaine Washington and British Columbia, or a series of, of, of bridges uh, across the various kind of waterways and other things are built to kind of commemorate this idea of peace between two countries. So what we see over the night, course of the 1920s and 1930s is this idea of Canadians and Americans um, being similar and putting putting warfare aside. Um, and that's certainly one of the kind of trends that seems to accelerate then uh, in the context of the kind of upsetting world of the 1920s and 1930s, um, when the idea of sort of Canada as this fireproof house far from inflammable materials, to quote, uh, quote an, uh, a Canadian politician who sent Senator Dan, Dan Durand comes into the fore. In American kind of popular culture and literature and through political rhetoric, this is called the era of isolationism, when America sort of isolated itself from the world's problems. A similar sort of ideas in Canada, sort of pictured here, Canadians and Americans tending to their, their kind of undefended border while the rest of the world goes to hell in a handbasket. And so that sense of Canada and the United States having a kind of unique relationship um, really takes hold. But obviously then in the crisis, crises, I should say, of the 1930s, um, you know, the, the, the ocean borders that kind of protect Canada look a little, little less secure. Um, and the world looks a far more scary. I mean, we can see maybe some parallels to today. And uh, we can see certainly parallels in today too, in the sense that Canada had a very small defense budget. Um, again, it was the, the time of the Great Depression, but also the sense of isolationism, Canada's tradition, really of underfunding the military. It goes right back to, to the founding of our country. Um, and so as you can see sort of pictured here in this, this uh, image, you know, Canada has, has pretty, pretty poor defenses as the world uh, looks uh, increasingly more threatening and dangerous. And that then becomes a problem um, in terms of Canada-US relations. And so in 1936, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the new American president, well, I'm sorry, he'd, he'd been in office by that point, so he was in for three years, uh, meets with William Lyon Mackenzie King in Quebec City. Um, and in an aside, in their discussion, uh, FDR, as you can see here from this quotation, essentially says, uh, you know, we're a country with close, close neighbors, close neighbors are great neighbors, um, but what we can't allow is for our good neighbors uh, to the North um, to be a threat. And that's not the sense that Canada is a threat to the United States directly, uh, but rather there's indirect threats that could come to the United States through a weakened Canada. And what FDR is really concerned about in 1936 is that Canada, Canadian military weakness would allow the Japanese, for instance, perhaps to, to, to operate out of Canadian waters uh, out of British Columbia or even land in British Columbia and raid into the United States. Um, and so that's obviously a problem for Canada is that Canadian weakness uh, potentially is then a national security threat to the United States. And so at a very time where Canadians and Americans are beginning to think it's inconceivable that they themselves would go to war with one another, it's the idea then of Canadian weakness being a threat to the United States that really begins to kind of take hold as an idea. Um, and certainly for our Prime Minister, William Mackenzie King, um, that's a big concern. And so what he does is shortly after this, he goes to cabinet, and this is in 1937, he says, we've got to begin increasing the defense budget. We've got to do this, A, because of problems in Europe, but also B, my friend FDR, and King very much considers himself a friend of the American president, um, you know, has made this kind of this, this kind of threat uh, in a friendly sort of way. Um, and so the idea of America then as a kind of a threat to Canada in this kind of roundabout way um, begins to also be a, 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 a way that Canadians begin to conceive of the United States. Um, and that's despite a lot of the kind of um, happy rhetoric of this uh, period. So FDR again talks about Canada as being good neighbors. And very famously then in 1938, he comes to Kingston, um, to Queen's University to give the commencement address. Um, and he gives this very famous uh, uh, a speech, uh, famous, maybe not so famous, but famous amongst uh, Canadian historians and, and, uh, and, uh, and people like me. Um, 
where he essentially says, I, I give you the insurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. So essentially, if, if another country is menacing Canada, whether it's Nazi Germany or, or, the, or the Empire of Japan, uh, the United States will come to Canada's aid, which sounds great. Um, now, historians have kind of viewed this in two ways. One, again, it's this sort of dispensation of, of uh, this Kingston dispensation, as it's sometimes called, where Roosevelt saying, essentially, we'll come to protect you, which sounds very nice. But it also indicates, again, the sense of Canadian weakness, that Canada needs the United States to defend us because we're not strong enough to defend ourselves. And so at the very time in which, over the course of the 1920s and 1930s, Canada had sort of beginning to emerge from, you know, under the under the apron strings of, under the apron of Mother Britain uh, and become an independent sort of country on the world stage, we suddenly have this threat that Canada might revert back to a kind of a, a satellite status or a colonial kind of status. And so FDR, after Roosevelt gives this big speech, he comes and meets with Mackenzie King and Mackenzie King says essentially, you know, again, if there's an enemy that's ever kind of threatening you, they won't be able to do it through Canadian uh, land, sea, or air. We'll defend, we'll defend ourselves and we'll defend you as well. So it's this idea of, as, as some political scientists have called it, of, of defense against help. Canada is going to build up its defenses to make sure it's not a threat to uh, the United States. Again, not directly, but in this kind of indirect way. And that idea, of course, then comes to, to be very important then in the context then of the Second World War. Um, Canada, of course, waits a week uh, to prove its independence from Britain to, 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 to declare war. And Mackenzie King is, is absolutely shattered uh, that the Americans remain neutral um, for a whole variety of reasons, um, partly to do with American domestic politics and other kinds of things. But the Americans essentially sit out the war, as we, as I think we all know, um, when it's declared in September 1939. And Mackenzie King's really bothered by um, that. Now, in terms of these kinds of big threads of sort of defense relations and other kinds of things, the problem then, of course, is that in the context of 1940, the fall of France, the fall of the other kind of Western European powers, Canada is left as essentially Britain's major ally. Um, and as you can sort of see depicted here in this uh, cartoon, uh, the threat of you know, the monstrous kind of Mr. Hitler there looming with Canada and its rich resources there. Um, in the distance. So this idea, of course, of Canada now potentially, uh, you know, a major player in the war um, with the fall of France and, uh, and the other Western allies. Um, and it's again in this context then that Roosevelt calls up his friends Mackenzie King and they meet uh, at the president's train car in Ogdensburg, New York, just across the border from Prescott. Uh, Ontario, just south of where some of you are in Ottawa today. Um, and uh, in August 1940, over a martini, uh, they they sign essentially this uh, this agreement called the Permanent Joint Board of Defense, um, where they essentially agree to set up uh, a, a committee of, of uh, military and government officials from both sides to consider, quote, in the broad sense, the defense of the northern half of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and this is often seen as the kind of you know, start of the canada uh, alliance, military alliance, um, and it's certainly possible to see that way. It's an interesting document in that it's a press release. It's not actually a treaty. If it was a treaty, it would have had to go to approval in the Senate. Who knows if the Senate would have, I mean, the U.S. Senate would have passed it. It also would have had to be approved in the Canadian House of Commons uh, or, or by Parliament, I should say. Um, and so it's actually a press release. So it's kind of an interesting document in a very informal way that FDR and King managed some elements of their relationship. Some people have often, including myself, have called this sort of evidence of a special relationship, the very informal way that Canada-U.S. relations are managed, but it's an important move in the sense that it signals the the kind of huge movement of Canada into, I guess, the kind of military, American kind of military sphere. And obviously, during the Second World War, uh, Canada will fight alongside the British Empire, uh, wearing you know British uniforms with, with Canadian Canadian flags pinned on and other kinds of things. You know, half a million Canadians will serve uh, much of the war in the British Isles themselves. There's obviously a lot of kind of pro pro empire, pro British kind of stuff that's going on during the war for the Canadians, but there's also this move of Canada into the kind of American military orbit. And as the wonderful historian Tim Cook has just documented in his great new book, uh, Good Allies, um, there's a whole series of a kind of cooperation between Canadians and Americans, a whole variety of ways on the economic front, on the natural resources front, obviously in the, the actual fighting uh, on land and sea and air, in the Pacific and in the Mediterranean, uh, and of course in, in Northwest Europe itself. Um, and it's in this, this uh, sort of you know, huge military cooperation during the Second World War that really we see the foundations of the Canada US Alliance, uh, economic relations, a whole series of other kinds of things. But there's this thread throughout of, again, Canadian fear of American domination, if you like. And so one of the things that the Americans do is they have a huge corps of engineers um, who build this massive highway from Alberta up to Alaska um, to bring through supplies. Uh, they, there's construction of air bases in Canadian, uh, Canadian North, again, to supply the Russians 
um, and to prepare for the uh, the, the American uh, Alaskan campaign, Aleutian campaign, and the Pacific wider kind of Pacific War. A huge series of American construction projects, um, which Mackenzie King is initially you know, happy to to see built because uh, it's building infrastructure. It's Americans building it, but it quickly dawns on him, of course, that there's American money, American people pouring into Canada. Um, there's this apocryphal story of uh, of, of an, you know, an American. Uh, ringing up, uh, sorry, being rung up, I think, by a journalist in, in Edmonton or something. So, you know, U.S. Army of Occupation, Edmonton. Uh, so this this kind of um, sense that some Canadians have that, you know, Americans, American money, American muscle and American manpower is moving in and really dominating and violating Canadian sovereignty. And King himself you know, gives a, writes in his diary in about 1943 or so about how upset he is about the claw of the United States sort of clawing at Canada's throat over the construction of the Alaska Highway. So at the same time as we see all this kind of defense cooperation and military cooperation and economic cooperation to win the war, there's this kind of fear uh, in Canada in the Canadian kind of mindset about um, American uh, dominance and American kind of violation of sovereignty. Now, one of the end results of the war um, is that Canada emerges as a so-called middle power, a uh, term first applied to Canada by the British newspaper, The Economist. Um, it's a recognition of Canada as you know, not quite a great power, certainly not a, a superpower, a term that's not quite coined yet, um, but certainly not a country like Guatemala or Portugal or, or uh no offense to those countries, Costa Rica, no offense to those countries, um, but uh, Canada, is, as, you know, as you can see from this quote, and the kind of sense as a cut above, a uh, huge military at the relevant relative terms of the start of the war, a, huge, a, bump, a booming economy that's recovered from the Great Depression, um, and that Canada is really in a class of its own then. Uh, and certainly so that's one of the developments that come to the war is that Canada has a greater relative uh, position of power in the world, but certainly nothing like the United States, which in 1945 accounts for 50% of global uh, gross domestic product, has obviously this massive uh, world-spanning military, a whole series of bases that it's established across across the globe. Um, and really, I mean, this is a wonderful image uh, you know, of an American-centric world, um, really encapsulating obviously the, the huge position the United States has in global affairs at the end of the Second World War, going into the post-war era, the kind of fulfillment, if you like, of Henry Luce, the time editor's famous phrase that the, the, the 20th century, you know, from the 1940s onwards will essentially be the American century, uh, really seeming to come uh, come to uh, come to fruition. And so there's a debate uh, ever since then about whether this was planned by the United States, whether it planned kind of a position of global dominance, global hegemony, whether it sort of fell into you know, this the kind of position, fell into its lap, etc. Um, and certainly from the position of this fellow, Lester B. Pearson, uh, who spent much of the Second World War, a Canadian diplomat who spent much of the Second World War in the Canadian embassy or legation, as it technically was, uh, in Washington, um, you know, viewing firsthand the emergence really of the United States as this kind of global, global spanning power. Um, he says in the in a speech in 1948, kind of reflecting back over the last few years, that essentially, you know, Americans have, have become a world power, uh, but really against their will. And that Americans are a deeply a democratic, unambitious uh, a people without kind of the, the desire for imperial pomp and rule. And again, if you're a, you know, a Marxist in 1948, this is certainly not uh, certainly not the, the, the received wisdom. Or if you're a new left radical a few decades later, this is certainly not the received wisdom. And I'm sure there's many people, perhaps in the audience, who think, well, this is complete hogwash. But it's certainly the perspective of a new class of Canadian diplomats who are emerging in the 1940s into the 1950s and 60s, the so-called golden age of Canadian foreign policy when Canada was this kind of middle power, um, that they had a very, in many cases, favorable view of the United States and a favorable view of America, um, in contrast, maybe a bit, uh, to the kind of previous views that had failed. Now, Lester A. Pearson, in his role uh, at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, um, at the end of the of the Second World War into uh, into the, uh, the, the mid 1940s, uh, accompanies uh, former British Prime Minister at this point in March 1946, former British Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill to uh, Fulton, Missouri, where he gives this very famous speech in front of uh, American President Henry Truman, where he essentially announces that the Iron Curtain is coming down. And Lester Pearson had actually seen the speech beforehand, seen a copy of the speech beforehand. According to his own account, he gave Churchill some advice that he took into the speech. I mean, who knows if he actually did. Uh, I've looked for evidence of it. It's, it's difficult to find, but uh, certainly that's the way Lester Pearson liked to portray things. And what he is, is he he, he writes a report back um, to his, uh, his, uh, 
uh, political masters in Ottawa, in which he essentially says, well, it's actually a shocking speech. It's a shocking speech in part because of the huge reception of Americans uh, that Americans had, that he witnesses, um, the kind of anti-Soviet attitudes that really are obviously present in the speech, but certainly in, in the kind of comment on it by people in the, in the room, by the American president, uh, and in the kind of press accounts. It's really shocking, he says, to see uh, Americans have this tendency, he says, to cheer vigorous speech uh, and veer away from the consequences. And so what he sees is, you know, American power is important. America is in this huge position of, of importance at the end of the war, but there's these kind of currents in American political life and in kind of foreign policy thinking um, that can be a bit of, uh, of uh, a danger. Uh, and we'll certainly see that as a, we'll talk about a few instances where that certainly seems to be the case. Now, obviously, Canada uh, finds itself embroiled in, uh, in, in, in obviously, the Guzenko spy scandal, 1945 um, into 1946. Obviously, I think as you've had a Guzenko talk, I think, at some point last year, maybe, was it Sean? Well, anyway, um, as some of you certainly in the audience will know, I think, um, you know, the Canadian government, particularly our Prime Minister Mackenzie King, was very reluctant, actually, to uh, you know, to 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 foster any ill will towards the Soviet Union, he wanted this issue to go away. Um, there was kind of reluctant, kind of Cold War attitudes on the part of uh, many people in the Canadian government. Um, but certainly, uh, rapidly, um, the new reality of the post-war world and what becomes we call the Cold War, you know, quickly becomes apparent. Um, but even before the you know, you know, the Cold War really becomes a factor. Um, we see that the, the government of William Allen Mackenzie King and the, the new administration of Harry Truman, of course, FDR dying in, in April 1945, um, really put into place um, some of those continuation of some of those wartime links. Um, so there's still, at least until 1946, cooperation on, on kind of atomic, atomic energy and atomic research. Um, what comes to be called the kind of Five Eyes intelligence arrangements, kind of intelligence sharing kind of arrangements that have begun during the war. Canada is a part of of some of that uh, continues onwards. Um, and a key kind of thing is that in 1946, the permanent joint board on defense is in effect kind of renewed. Again, it had been kind of a press release, not a formal agreement. Uh, it's really formalized then in, uh, in early 1946 um, as something that will be indeed permanent as the name implies. It won't just be created just for the duration of the war, but will continue on. And then indeed it, it's still, uh, still uh, operative today. Um, and there are discussions uh, that proceed basically to the to the, the point of drafting an agreement on a Canada-U.S. Customs Union, a free trade agreement in effect, um, that the King government and the Harry Truman administration work out. Uh, it's all ready to go in 1948. And then Mackenzie King eventually says, uh, you know, if we do this, it'll the voters will destroy us at the polls like they did in the very famous free trade election in 1911, which of course Mackenzie King had been a candidate in, and he had always kind of carried the shadows of that with him throughout his political career. And so there's these signs of ongoing... Um, economic and military cooperation, intelligence cooperation, are the kinds of things that had begun during the war that continued on to the post-war era. And even though this free trade agreement or customs union is, is, is cancelled by Canada in 1948, the kind of you know, cross-border interchange investment uh, and other kinds of things you know, s s speed up in the context then of the 1940s. But uh, obviously Mackenzie King 1948 is on his way out of uh, of, uh, of office, and it's this fellow Louis Saint Laurent, he's uh, been a wartime justice minister, uh, and then becomes, uh, in 1946, a Secretary of State for External Affairs, the Foreign Minister. Um, and in that context, then in 1947, very famously, Louis saint Laurent announces, in effect, kind of a new foreign policy. Uh, and there's some debate about, you know, amongst historians about how serious he was, but certainly it, 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 it was an anti, no, no, maybe not anti, un, un mackenzie king like speech in which he called for a whole series of, of reforms to Canadian foreign policy. But the, the key kind of thing was a, quote, a willingness to act, uh, sorry, to, to, uh, to undertake kind of international responsibilities. Um, well, kind of a marker away from King, who'd been far more cautious. But in this speech, um, St. Laurent also makes the point uh, that Canada is a small country. And as he says, there's a little point of country of our statue in recommending international action if those who must carry the major burden of whatever action uh, to be taken are not in sympathy. And so he says, essentially, we're a middle power, not a great power. And so essentially, we are a junior power, in effect, in comparison to Britain, France, and really the United States. And so, yes, we're going to take on international responsibilities, but we also have to be mindful of kind of power relations that exist in the world. Um, and so, again, at the same time as there's this kind of explosion of, you know, uh, positive attitudes about what the post-war world could be, but things like the United Nations and kinds of things, there's kind of a, a note of realism in this kind of attitude. 
And as Lester Pearson will say, and Lester Pearson at this point is his is Lucien's deputy, the deputy minister of, of foreign affairs, in effect, uh, says essentially, you know, Canada has every interest in strengthening the U.S. position as the leader in the struggle against communism. So again, this sense that Canada needs a more engaged foreign policy, but we're also mindful of the fact that it's America who's going to be carrying the burden, and America, and indeed American leadership, is something we want. And so these are the sort of strands pulling together in Canadian thought. Um, but we could certainly see these these kinds of strands. Um, uh, play out in the kind of Canadian debates around the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which began in earnest in 1948. Uh, again, you, I think next week or the week after, a wonderful historian, Susan Colborn, will be talking about uh, Canada and NATO, so I'm not going to get into the details, but what's pertinent here uh, um, is that but by 1948, Lester Pearson is now foreign minister, Louis Saint Laurent becomes prime minister, uh, and you can see, you know, Lester Pearson makes essentially two, two telling comments about NATO, is that one of the key things that NATO will do is it will, will involve America in an alliance so that we have a firm commitment that America will actually be involved in, in Atlantic security, that America, the, again, the key part of NATO is Article 5, that an you know, attack on one is an attack on all. America will, if push comes to shove, come to the defense of Western European countries. That's a key kind of thing. Because what the Canadians are very concerned of is a reversion to American isolationism. They're very, you know, it's, it's only been, it's not been that long since America well, was isolationist. There's a big faction within the Republican party at this time, you know, today, um, that's isolationist. Um, and so they're very concerned, uh, particularly with upcoming presidential elections and things, that those isolationists, particularly in Congress and the Senate, but also but also could, could win the presidency. Um, and so NATO will give a permanent, or at least as ongoing as, as, as NATO will last, uh, American commitment. So that's one key thing that NATO will accomplish, is that sense, again, that American leadership is required in the world, that we can't have a reversion to the isolationism of the 1920s and 1930s, which had clearly been a mistake in, in, in the view of Lester Pearson and, and his kind of generation of Canadians. Um, but as he, as he also notes, there's a danger, of course, in that America is... Um, so dominant uh, and so politically and economically powerful. And again, there's the sense of American uh, exceptionalism that, that he notes and kind of, you know, hysteria about communism. And so America might, of course, um, insist on, 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 you know, or on, you know, if there is a war or something, uh, you know, taking the, the load itself and not listening to its allies. Um, and so there's this kind of twin, twin elements of, again, American power. American power is important, again, as this kind of, guarantor of, of ultimate security and leadership in the world, but also the Americans are a bit excitable and domineering and, and you know, push people around. And so um, these are the kind of strands we, we are seeing here. Um, in terms of that issue of isolationism, so anyway, NATO is, is agreed to in, in April 1949. There's then a series of kind of disasters uh, as far as the allies, you know, the, the Western allies are concerned. One is that the Russians, the Soviets, uh, developed their own nuclear weapon uh, in August 1949. And then in October, uh, the Chinese uh, communists take power in, in Beijing, uh, ending the civil war there, at least sort of. Uh, we'll talk about maybe Taiwan in just a moment. Um, and uh, you know, things get pretty disastrous looking. And so in 1950 then, there's a big push uh, by the Canadian government partly pushed along by the Americans uh, to boost uh, defense spending. Um, and in a submission to cabinet, Lester Pearson and a uh, Canadian defense minister, Brooke Claxon essentially say, we need to increase defense spending. And they, they issue a whole de detailed agenda, detailed points about you know, what money needs to be spent on. But in their submission, they note, essentially their cabinet colleagues, essentially, we need to, to increase defense spending to make essentially the Americans feel that they're not paying the whole load themselves. And again, we see a fear that uh, maybe the cabinet today is expressing these fears about Mr. Trump uh, or even the Biden administration, which certainly wants American allies to pay more and do more for defense. And so that's the kind of idea here is that, you know, isolationists are circling around. Um, and if America seem to be footing the bill entirely, uh, that'll look bad. And so one of the reasons we need defense increased defense spending is to ensure American leadership in the world. And so indeed, lo and behold, by 1951, uh, there's a massive increase in American Canadian defense spending. And of course, very famously, then in 1953, 1954, uh, Canadian defense spending reaches something the equivalent of 7.6% of GDP, something uh, you know, our friends and colleagues in national defense headquarters couldn't imagine today. Um, but there you go. Now, the reason, of course, why this is happening is uh, there's a series of um, you know, contributions uh, or, or, or commitments that are pulling on, on, on the Canadian first One is that Canada uh, agrees in 1951 to deploy uh, forces to NATO, to, to essentially to, to Western Europe. Again, I think Dr. Colburn probably talked about this a bit more, uh, but this involves essentially a, a permanent, in effect, until it ends obviously in the 1990s, but a permanent uh, deployment of troops 
um, to, 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 to Western Europe in peacetime, uh, although the Cold War maybe not so quite so peaceful. Um, but, uh, you know, a pretty revolutionary move on the part of Canada, which had traditionally not been in favor of, of, of peacetime spending. Um, but obviously is a very expensive kind of task. The other kind of thing is obviously the outbreak then in June 1950 of, of war in Korea. Uh, which quickly involves then the United Nations uh, and through its kind of collective security commitments then and desire um, to support the Americans, um, Canada will eventually agree to uh, to, to dispatch uh, naval ground and, and even some air assets uh, to the Korean War. Again, I think you had Andrew Birch uh, give a talk a, a while ago on that. And he's uh, uh, edited a, a great book with uh, Tim Cook recently on Canada Korean War. It's just to, uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, but in terms of kind of, the, again, these kind of strands we've been talking about, on the one hand, uh, Lester Pearson, uh, it, throughout the kind of outbreak of the Korean War, so essentially this is, you know, a terrible thing that's happened. But what's great is that the Americans have agreed to send troops. And the Americans have agreed to kind of through the United Nations make this a collective security uh, effort, a common kind of collective security effort. It's great then, he says, that the Americans are undertaking their special responsibility, that the Americans are essentially pushing back against communism. Um, and again, under pressure, in effect, the Americans, the Canadians will agree to send, uh, send, uh, send air and naval assets and ground assets as well. Uh, Canada originally wanted to send uh, three destroyers. The American ambassador you know, quips that that's only basically three tokens that are, the Canadians are being sent, uh, and the Canadians will agree to eventually send more, more, um, more uh, naval assets and eventually ground troops, as I say. Um, by the time those Canadian ground troops arrive in 1951, um, the Korean War very much uh, shifts in focus. Again, we don't have time to go into great details, uh, but in part because of the actions of this uh, fellow here, uh, Douglas MacArthur, uh, the commander of UN forces, but of course the commander of US forces, um, he'd, uh, and again, there's a debate amongst historians about how much MacArthur is to blame or how much Mao Zedong is to blame, uh, but certainly the Chinese had come into the war uh, in October, uh, late October 1950, um, and uh, reversed a lot of the successes that the UN and American forces and uh, South Korean forces had won. Um, and of course, there was then uh, fears that the Americans would deploy nuclear weapons uh, to target uh, target uh, um, China, and result you know the result could be a world war. Um, and so the Canadians had, had put a lot of pressure on the White House. Uh, not to use nuclear weapons. There had been a, a kind of shuttle diplomacy. Lester Pearson had actually smuggled himself into the White House uh, in the back of a tr trunk of a car uh, in secret uh, to not alarm the American press, um, to lobby Harry Truman personally about uh, not using nuclear weapons. Um, and after this whole kind of brouhaha, uh, Lester Pearson gives a speech in Toronto where he says, essentially, the days of relatively smooth and automatic relations with our neighbor are, I think, over. And about that, what he meant was, um, you know, Canada's relations at the kind of personal level, the economic level, the level of tourism and border management, you know, water management, all that stuff is easy. Um, but what, what will be complicating from, from now going, going, going forward will be the fact that so much of Canada's relations will take place under the shadow of these huge kind of geopolitical issues. So no longer is it just sort of Canada's relations going to be out managing our common continental interests, but a huge part of it now will take place under the shadow of the atomic bomb um, and the wider kind of Cold War context. And so a huge part of the kind of diplomacy between the two countries will now be caught up in these huge, 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 huge questions of, of war and peace, something that had not really been the case, you know, in the 1920s or 1930s or when the issues were the you know, management of the St. Lawrence Seaway or the Columbia River Treaty or other kind of thing. Um, and as he says also in this speech, you know, a big issue now will not be whether the United States will undertake its international responsibilities, it's shown it will do that in Korea, um, but whether the other, the rest of us uh, will be involved and how we will be involved, essentially, will we just kind of be meant to rubber stamp the Americans or will we have some say over how American forces are used? Um, and the Korean War really left a lot of Canadian officials, certainly, um, upset uh, that the Americans had, had brought the Chinese in and kind of sidelined the United Nations and, and, uh, and other sorts of things. Um, and certainly from 1951 onwards, the Canadians are then involved in diplomatic efforts um, to, to bring about an armistice, uh, to negotiations over prisoners of war uh, and some other kinds of, of, of issues uh, connected to kind of ending the Korean War. And that really upsets uh, Dean Acheson, the American Secretary of State, um, who in a series of, of uh, private comments and other sorts of things really makes it clear that he's really upset with Lester Pearson. And that's despite the fact that they were great friends. Uh, when uh, Dean Acheson was appointed to be U.S. Secretary of State, um, you know, Lester Pearson wrote a note. I'm, I'm uh, personally and professionally and alcoholically excited to uh, to have you in this position because they were great drinking buddies. Um, but they've had a falling out then over the Korean War, um, and certainly Lester Pearson's kind of vocal support for an armistice. 
um, brought him to the attention of then conservative figures, uh, anti-communist kind of rabble rousers, the, 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 the owner of the Chicago Tribune, or then Robert McCormick, made Lester Pearson a target of, of a whole series of kind of undercover investigations and skating editorials. Um, to undercover if Lester Pearson was a communist agent. And of course, there were these kind of swirling rumors in the House on Un-American Activities Committee that Lester Pearson was a communist because he dared to dared to question some elements of U.S. foreign policy. Um, and that's a reflection of the fact that Canada had begun to acquire for itself a middle power role, not just in the sense of being a middle power, a, a, not a great power, a small power, uh, but also what came to be called the middle power role in the kind of popular Canadian imagination, uh, where Canada would fulfill a role in kind of negotiating an end to crises. Canada would find itself as a quote unquote honest broker, um, you know, trying to find, for instance, an armistice deal in, 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 in Korea. Um, and certainly there was a sense that Canada could play a role here. Certainly that's depicted in this uh, editorial cartoon here, where, where there's a, a Louis Saint Laurent wading into the kind of fighting between the Americans and the Chinese. Um, and also, again, for someone like Lester Pearson, as he comments just after um, he receives, again, a lot of hate mail uh, for the speech he gave in 1951, um, uh, he says, essentially, you know, one of the problems we're feeling is that, you know, maybe unconsciously, um, is this feeling of dependence on the United States. No matter how hard we try, we can't escape the fact that we're dependent on the United States in, in this, this new world order. Um, and so in terms of foreign policy terms, you know, are there op opportunities then to kind of pursue an independent role in the world? And so, again, in terms of kind of the wide kind of gamut of Canadian foreign policy in the Cold War or the Cold War period, um, there's kind of two strands that, that kind of occur. One is to kind of have good relations with the United States. The kind of measure then becomes uh, the relationships between presidents and prime ministers, something that had really not been anyone's really concern uh, in the 1920s or 1930s, or certainly in the days of Sir Johnny MacDonald. Uh, no one had really cared if the president or prime minister got on. Well, that becomes now the, the lodestar for gauging uh, is the county US relationship in good repair. I think president prime minister relations good. And certainly the relationships uh, between uh, Louis Saint Laurent and uh, Dwight Eisenhower are very good. They were good golfing buddies. Um, and so that that sort of sense of, of having good relations with the Americans is one strand. The other strand, of course, is this sense of can Canada have an independent role in the world? Is there kind of room for Canada to offer its advice to the Americans um, in particular? Um, and again, that's that kind of middle power role. And so there's Lester Pearson and John Foster Dulles, uh, who for many years was uh, Dwight Eisenhower's Secretary of State, a ferocious anti-communist. Um, but someone who also recognized the value of actually of Canada's middle power role. And so what we find is this middle power role could sometimes upset the Americans, but also sometimes could be of a value. And so, for instance, in 1954, again, we don't have time to go in great detail, but essentially um, uh, in, in Indochina, uh, the Vietnam, modern day Vietnam, um, the French had been fighting essentially a losing war uh, to keep a hold of this, this what had been their colony. Uh, in 19, early 1954, it seems to be going disastrously for the French. Uh, and so the French actually plead for help from the, the, the Americans to come in uh, and the Eisenhower administration debates whether to deploy nuclear weapons and intervene militarily. Uh, and the Canadians undertake a lobbying effort essentially with the, with the British to convince the Americans not to do this. And the end result of this is essentially a, a kind of a, 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 an agreement concluded in Geneva. There's a huge kind of peace conference actually to deal with the Korean War in Geneva, but the side, uh, side conference is held to deal with this question of Indochina. Uh, and what eventually happens is the, the, essentially the creation of North and South Vietnam as temporary countries. Um, and something called the International Control Commissions, uh, essentially peacekeeping organization, peacekeeping outfits, for lack of a better kind of term, in which Canada will serve alongside India and Poland to kind of monitor elections, monitor the borders, ensure there's no armed smuggling and other kinds of things. It doesn't go very well in the long term. Um, but certainly the Americans welcome uh, and we actually kind of push the Canadians toward participating in this, uh, in this uh, mediatory kind of role. Now, what we know from behind the scenes, there's a wonderful story at the University of Toronto, Tim Sale, who's done a lot of work on this, uh, kind of revealing the documentary record of what people had always suspected. And that's, of course, that the Canadian members of the International Control Commission spied for the Americans on this, this role. Um, and so, again, we see sort of the, the helpful role that Canadians can play behind the scenes for the Americans. At the same time, as Canadians are undertaking a, a, you know, a role fitting, befitting of the kind of post-war middle power internationalism. Um, so interesting, interesting kind of uh, you know, strands of thought here. Um, at the same time, as the Canadians are sort of you know, undertaking this helpful role for the Americans in Indochina, um, there's a brewing crisis over a series of islands um, in between the Taiwan Strait, essentially that, the, that on one side, the Republic of China, Taiwan, claimed um, for themselves, the Chinese government, uh, the, sorry, the Chinese Communist government, uh, the People's Republic of China, claimed these islands for themselves, called Koei Maimatsu. And in 1954, 
um, the, the PRC, the Red China, began shelling uh, shelling these islands, and there was a war scare essentially. And um, the, the Americans move in some aircraft carriers and indicate that they're willing to essentially use nuclear weapons against the Chinese. And the Canadians, of course, say, "Well, this is a disastrous war. We don't want to be dragged into it." As Lester Pearson comments privately, "You know, if the, this this is war has nothing to do with Canada, except if the Americans are involved in it, we'll now be automatically involved in it." And so there's kind of shuttle diplomacy by Lester Pearson to go to the British and uh, work with the British then to 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 uh, uh, press uh, John Foster Dulles um, to say, you know, don't go to war over over these little islands because they're kind of a diplomatic solution. Um, and there's this wonderful kind of exchange then between uh, John Foster Dulles and Lester Pearson, where D Dulles says essentially, you know, if we were we were on the 18th, uh, you know, Green, we were out to sink a putt, um, you know, you, you Canadians would probably be offering some advice, even though we could we could do it ourselves. And of course, Lester Pearson says, well, yes, but if you're using, a, you know. A, a nine iron to do it, I'd have to tell you that you're wrong. So um, it's the sense again that you know that, that you know the Americans could use some Canadian advice. Um, so at the same time as Canada is um, you know urging you know using its own 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 prerogative to essentially press its own interests at the Americans essentially don't go to war for instance with China. Canada is also mindful of American interests, and so in 1949 when uh, the Chinese Civil War uh, you know, results in, in, in the communists coming to power in Beijing, uh, Canada had prepared essentially to recognize the government in, in, in Beijing, the communist government, um, had begun the process of doing so in 1950, and that's because the British essentially had a policy of recognizing whoever. Um, and so, um, but the, the Americans said, well, we don't recognize this government, it's illegitimate, it's an evil communist government, we only recognize the government in, in Formosa or Taiwan um, as the legitimate government of China. And uh, uh, and sort of weighing the British option to recognize the government of Beijing, or the British or the American option not to, the, the Canadians chose uh, chose the American option. Um, really feeling the kind of pressure from the Americans, and also realizing this was a fundamental kind of domestic policy issue for the Americans. China lobby really pressing Dwight Eisenhower into a tough policy towards uh, Red China, as it was called at the time. Um, and so the Canadians opted to say essentially, you know, we're, we're going to pursue our interests with, 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 with the, the Americans over over maybe you know other relations with China, et cetera. Anyway, in terms of the middle power role, uh, we see some, some helpful kind of role for Canada as well. And for instance, the very storied Suez crisis where the Eisenhower administration was very thankful for the, the Canadian uh, kind of pursuit of, uh, of the peacekeeping option at the United Nations. At the same time as the Eisenhower administration really brought economic pressure onto the British to withdraw from that, uh, from that invasion. We don't have time to go into great detail about it. But again, the middle power role for the Americans could uh, sometimes be upsetting, if the, you know, these, these Canadians giving advice that the Americans didn't appreciate sometimes, uh, but also the middle power role being really helpful for the Canadians in, in, in some places. Now, to get back to kind of the, the kind of traditional kind of um, stuff we talked about kind of the beginning of our, of our, of our, or my, my, my talk today is kind of the, the very fact of geography. And of course, in the Cold War, Canada occupied a very unfavorable geography, um, where at least uh, till the early 1960s, um, any kind of nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States would occur in Canadian airspace over potentially over Canadian cities, a very disastrous uh, potential situation. Um, and this raises those kind of age-old questions, going back to the kind of you know pressure that Mackenzie King had felt. Uh, from FDR in the 1930s, this kind of question about our sovereignty, defending Canadian sovereignty um, uh, means a strong national defense. We've got to defend, you know, not only from the threats of the Russians, uh, but essentially from the threat of a too friendly United States uh, wanting to defend itself through Canadian territory. Um, and you can see that sort of depicted here in these political cartoons. And um, so part of what the Canadian uh, military is, you know, in effect tasked to do during the Cold War period um, is to defend Canada, uh, Canadian territorial water, Canadian airspace, um, not just from the Soviets, uh, but obviously, well, but also in, in effect from the Americans. And so the Royal Canadian Navy, for instance, undertakes anti-submarine warfare operations or anti-submarine warfare roles. You know, part of that big um, rearmament that takes place beginning in 1951, there's the whole setting up of new air bases. Um, or, or reactivation of air bases that have been operational during the Second World War and closed down. Many of them pointed, again, to defending uh, against a Soviet attack across the Arctic, but also, in effect, defending uh, the United States um, as well. Um, and indeed, in the discourse in Canadian you know, government documents and, and cabinet reports and the kinds of things, the big thing is the need, the fundamental need to defend the American nuclear deterrent becomes singled out as one of the major purposes of, the, of Canadian defense policies, actually to defend the American nuclear deterrent to ensure um, um, that uh, you know, the Americans can strike against the Soviets. And so Canadian defense policy becomes based around defending the United States. Um, and so there's a whole series of ways that's done, um, partly, again, through setting up air bases 
and, and deploying new squadrons of, of, of uh, interceptors and other kind of things. Uh, the construction of various radar lines. I think some people know things like the Dew Line and, and those kinds of things. Um, just an interesting kind of coda is uh, Harmon Air Force Base in uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, um, had been purchased uh, by the Americans or, or, or taken over by the Americans in the Second World War from the British. Um, and then when Newfoundland becomes a part of Canada, uh, there's this American air base in the Canadian territory um, where uh, I mean, some of the documents are still a bit unclear, but it seems that you know, American bombers were operating uh, with nuclear weapons or nuclear armed bombers um, out of, in effect, Canadian air space. But, but more broadly, um, there's joint cooperation throughout the 1950s between uh, the Canadian and American militaries to allow U.S. Air Force uh fighters uh, to, to operate in Canadian airspace, to allow American bombers to overfly Canada and Canadian territory. Um, the one thing Canada can insists on in these series of agreements is the fact that the Americans have to give prior consent to Canada. Again, this kind of recognition of sovereignty, um, despite the fact that the Canadians are, are, are approving kind of defense cooperation. So it's not a zero-sum game or an either-or kind of thing, uh, but there's insistence on defense cooperation as long as sovereignty is sort of assured. Um, and obviously NORAD, the NORAD Agreement North American Air Defense Command, now Aerospace Defense Command, it really exemplifies, again, that kind of sense of cooperation, um, but also the sense of, of Canadian sovereignty should be respected. And of course, the idea is then if there's going to be, you know, American huge defense coordination defending its airspace, Canada should have someone in the room, uh, someone in headquarters to kind of make that happen. And there should be a kind of a formal agreement um, as, as the kind of negotiations over NORAD uh, uh, do to, to, to ensure that the prime minister and president have some sort of um, ability to, uh, to, to, to discuss matters. And so that's when we get then to our friend, John Diefenbaker, my friend, John Diefenbaker, not a personal friend, but I like to consider him a fan. Um, who obviously becomes prime minister in 1957, partly on a campaign in which he warns that Canada is set to become uh, the 49th state of, uh, of the United States. That's the time, of course, where Hawaii and, uh, and Arizona, I don't think, are states yet. So that's why that, those numbers uh, work. Um, his huge warnings that the liberals, you know, over six, you know, 24 uh, years of liberal rule or whatever it is, 22 years of liberal rule, successive liberal governments had essentially sold Canadian economic interests down the, down the river, sold out Canadian national uh, resources to, to American investors. Um, and wants to revive the, sort of the national policy of uh, Sir John Macdonald from the 1880s uh, to build up a Canadian economy, but a by Canadian economy. Um, but when the rubber beats the road, uh, John D. Baker doesn't have kind of an anti-American policies at all. His economic policies largely continue the same. Um, and certainly uh, he puts great stock in his relationship with Dwight Eisenhower, who also, I should say, puts on the kind of the red carpet treatment of Diefenbaker um, to kind of you know, ensure that American, or sorry, that Canadian nationalism isn't going to get kind of too out of hand. Um, and I just, Eisenhower is very good at uh, sort of realizing Canadian interests at, are at stake on some things. He was actually a very good president for, for Canada. Um, in terms of, of kind of defense cooperation, Cold War cooperation, Cold War issues, you know, despite this kind of anti-American rhetoric that really characterized the Diefenbaker election campaigns in 1957 and 1958, um, you know, he, it's, it's his government that signs on to NORAD. It's his government that, uh, that uh, agrees to, you know, other defense cooperation agreements and other kinds of things. Um, and it's his government that, even though he thinks not recognizing communist China is a silly thing to do, uh, it's his government that agrees to not to continue the, the liberal policy of not recognizing the government of Beijing. At the same time, uh, the, the, the conservative government um, signs a huge uh, wheat deal with China to sell it hundreds of $130 million in 1960 money. That's a lot of money, uh, in part because of the, 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 the Mao-induced famine that's uh, raging through, through, through that country. So um, Canada's you know, mindful of American interests um, on this kind of key issue. Uh, and like the Liberal government, uh, in the, there's, there's a second crisis uh, between these offshore islands between Taiwan and China. Canada adopts a very similar policy of kind of lobbying the Americans not to go too far. So some similarities between the Liberals and the Conservatives, despite the the kind of um, rancor between the Pearson and the Diefenbaker years that some some people only know. Now Diefenbaker obviously famous for the the CF 105 Arrow, um, a topic I hate. I'm sorry. Apologies to any Arrow fans in the audience. When I was a professor at Royal Military College, I banned my students from writing on this topic because I've read a thousand Avro Arrow papers. Um, I don't want to go into great detail, although maybe in the questions, I question block we can. Anyway, the end result of, of, of the, you know, the, the fallout of the cancellation of the Avro in 1959 is the Canadian agreement um, to acquire American uh, weapon systems to defend Canadian airspace. The Avro Arrow obviously had been meant to intercept Soviet bombers coming into Canada. Um, you know, that, that sort of sense of defending Canada to defend the United States um, becomes a kind of thing. And so there's the, the, the acquisition of CF-101 um, 
uh, interceptor aircraft, which would be armed with nuclear armed uh, uh, sidearm uh, missiles. And of course, the very famous Beaumark missile, surface air missile, uh, two sites, La Casa Quebec and the North Bay, Ontario, um, which would be a nuclear armed uh, anti anti uh, anti aircraft missile. Um, but of course, I think as people in the audience will know, uh, it's Stephen Baker who accepts these uh, weapon systems, uh, but doesn't actually accept the nuclear warheads. And so it's the sort of either old policy um, that he adopts. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for this. Um, one of the chief ones is, of course, that the Canadian cabinet itself is not decided on supporting this. The, the, the Secretary of State uh, for External Affairs, Howard Green, is a huge supporter of nuclear disarmament. He thinks it would be terrible if Canada accepts nuclear weapons, on, particularly on Canadian territory. Um, and the Defense Department, led at first by a guy named George Perks, and then eventually uh, Douglas Harkness, depicted in this uh, cartoon here, uh, is in favor, obviously, of acquiring nuclear weapons. And there's kind of an even split in the cabinet. Uh, Ethan Baker himself is up to mind. I uh, can't really make, make a decision. Um, and as a number of, of historians have shown, uh, Patricia McMahon, uh, perhaps uh, most uh, most uh, recently, um, Diefmaker was also mindful of the kind of growing anti-nuclear activism, growing anti-nuclear sentiment amongst Canadians who began to be really concerned about nuclear fallout and obviously being irradiated uh, by a nuclear war, um, particularly by the, by the late 1950s, 1960s. So a whole series of currents really pressing in on, um, on the Diefmaker government. Um, and again, the Diefmaker government, um, um, you know, willing to kind of put its own interests uh, first, despite the kind of good relations between Eisenhower and Kennedy, or Eisenhower, pardon me, and, uh, and uh, who foreshadowed in there, Eisenhower and Diefenbaker. Um, you know, Diefenbaker wasn't willing to take nuclear warheads. And this is an outs one of the outstanding issues that's left over as Eisenhower leaves office in January 1961. The other is, is of course, American policy towards Cuba, uh, the imposition of, of a partial embargo in October 1960, a partial American trade embargo against Cuba, really leaves Canada's policy of having normal trade relations with Cuba um, as a kind of a, a sore thumb uh, sort of sticking out. And there's a lot of negative comment in the American Congress and press and other kinds of things about Canada's independent policy towards Cuba. And that obviously becomes magnified then when John F. Kennedy becomes president. Uh, you know, the, the trade issue with Cuba becomes a huge uh, problem uh, in Canada's relations, um, as does the nuclear issue. These are two huge issues for them. Uh, these two uh, fellows who, of course, I think people will know perhaps very famously mismatched uh, in terms of personality, uh, in terms of policy, lots of differences between Kennedy um, and, uh, and Diefenbaker and matters, of course, then uh, come to a head. And the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, um, when Canada's government, or at least the Diefenbaker, I should say, uh, refuses uh, uh, to, to authorize kind of a NORAD um, to go on the same kind of alert status, the Canadian military to go on the same alert status as the U.S. military uh, for several days. As we know behind the scenes, Canadian Defence Minister and the Department of National Defence, the, the generals and, uh, and other, other so flag officers, uh, general officer, flag officers, essentially authorized Canadian forces to go on alert anyway. Um, and in public, Diefenbaker makes some state statements kind of questioning, uh, you know, well, if, if Kennedy's lying about the presence of these missiles. It's a big diplomatic and uh, political kind of crisis. And what it does is it puts a lot of pressure then on Diefenbaker to finally conclude uh, the acceptance of nuclear weapons. It also makes this a big kind of hot potato domestically, the nuclear issue domestically in Canada. And the Liberal Party, now led by Lester Pearson, uh, agrees in uh, in January 1963 to alter its policy. It had an anti-nuclear policy, agrees in January 1963 um, to accept nuclear weapons um, for the Beaumark and, and other sorts of weapon systems. Um, and uh, despite the fact that there could then have been a cross-party support then for nuclear weapons, Diefenbaker views this as a plot from the Americans in league with the Liberal Party, in league with the Canadian military, uh, what you know, Donald Trump might call the deep state, um, to oust him uh, from power. And, and so uh, rather than uh, accept nuclear weapons, Diefenbaker switches his policy and says now he's going to be anti-nuclear weapons um, and starts a kind of diplomatic crisis with the Americans that eventually leads to the collapse of his government in a non-confidence vote, uh, the cabinet revolt, and an election then in, in uh, April 1963 that returns um, a, a liberal government um, to power. And uh, Lester Pearson will accept nuclear weapons um, and try to put uh, good relations with the Americans uh, for, for, forward. Um, that's obviously tested uh, in part by um, you know, the, the, the bizarre character of Lyndon Baines Johnson, the American president, who has a very uh, interesting personal uh, behavior, um, I, I, I should say. Uh, people think Mr. Trump is a boor. Uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson... 
we did it first to do all those things first. Anyway, um, but of course, one the major, major kind of issue for Lyndon Johnson obviously was the Vietnam War, which comes directly as presidency. Obviously, um, it had been something that Lister Pearson, having seen you know the American experience in Korea, having seen you know the, the other kinds of issues in, in China, other kinds of things, had warned uh, Lyndon Johnson against getting involved in a land war in Asia. Um, but publicly, um, still supports the Americans. He says essentially fundamentally, you know, the Americans are standing for for on the right side of history, um, even if we have some questions perhaps about their methods. And of course, very famously. Uh, um, in April 1965, in, uh, in, in a speech in Philadelphia where it's always sunny, uh, Lestrade Pearson um, questions some elements of American uh, American military policy. Uh, he's, he's not anti-American involvement in Vietnam, at least publicly, um, but he, he questions some elements of this. Of course, Lyndon Johnson very famously then summons him to Camp David and berates him, uh, you know, decries him pissing on his rug, quote unquote. Um, it's a very ugly scene. Um, but um, Lyndon Johnson, because we now have access to all of Lyndon Johnson's phone calls, um, actually afterwards gives a series of, of discussions with members of the Senate and Congress in which he says, you know, Lester Pearson, I'm going to kind of ignore him, give him the cold shoulder for a while, but actually I understand he's a politician. He had to say these kinds of things to placate domestic opinion. I kind of still like him anyway. Um, and so even though this is you know, thought of as this very kind of public public falling out between them, in private, Lyndon Johnson fully understood Lester Pearson's position. What he didn't want was Lester Pearson giving a speech on American soil, essentially questioning American policy. Um, and again, the, in terms of the kind of things like the middle power role, uh, the Americans, even after the fallout of this, this speech incident in 1965, continued to use Canadian diplomats to try to find uh, a possibility of a ceasefire negotiated agreement uh, with, the, with the North Vietnamese, the Canadians. Stickens still had people on the ground through the International Control Commission and some other diplomats uh, who were going back and forth uh, between the North Vietnamese and the, and, and the White House. Um, to see if a peace agreement could happen, didn't happen. The other kind of thing that made the, this this you know Vietnam issue um, less of a of a, a thing for falling out is that Canada and the United States had signed something in 1958 again under the Diefenbaker government, supposedly anti-American, called the Defense Production Sharing Agreement, which essentially allowed Canadian companies to be treated as American companies for the purposes of American military procurement. Uh, so the American, um, you know, Defense Department was buying Canadian-made military equipment and uh, munitions and other kinds of things throughout the Vietnam War. Um, and so you can see the Canadian Foreign Minister Paul Martin there, kind of pictured as, a, as an angel of peace, but carrying uh, a whole bunch of weapon uh, money procured from American arms sales. Um, and that kind of sense of so-called Canadian complicity in the war effort became a major kind of um, protest point for huge numbers of young people um, in the 1960s and into the 70s. And this is often seen in the kind of, you know, history of this period as the kind of end of a kind of consensus between Canadians and Americans, the end of a kind of Cold War consensus, the end of Cold War consensus in the United States itself over the need to contain communism and other kinds of things. What's a kind of a fascinating coda to this, though, is that there are thousands of Canadians who served in the American Armed Forces um, in the Vietnam War. Some of them were dual citizens, uh, but many of them uh, were people who wanted to go fight communists. Maybe they wanted a job, maybe they wanted an adventure. Um, a whole variety of reasons, but again, thousands of Canadians uh, crossed the border and signed up and enlisted with American forces. So again, if there was a kind of an end of Cold War consensus, um, maybe it occurred in some quarters, uh, you know, the faculty lounges and student uh, dorms of, of the University of Toronto or someplace, but not necessarily in other places as well. Um, and again, often, often again, in, in the historiography, the history of this period, it's, it's Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who's kind of seen as the figure who really kind of upsets the Cold War consensus. Um, but he still keeps Canada and NATO. There's some waffling about, about to Pierre Trudeau about that, but ultimately he keeps Canada and NATO. Um, there's some kind of sniping across the border between himself and Richard Nixon. But as again, as we know from their kind of private correspondence and private phone calls and other kinds of things, they seem to tolerate one another, even if they said, you know, terrible four letter words about one another. Um, and actually in the kind of lowest kind of depths of Richard Nixon's presidency in the wake of the kind of Watergate scandal, he's heavily drinking um, and was thinking about uh, resigning. He actually received a few phone calls from Pierre Elliott Trudeau who kind of gave him some pep talks. So interesting kind of personal relationships um, between them. Of course, it's very famously, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau is seen as kind of thumbing his nose at the Americans over recognizing communist China, which Canada finally did. Uh, establishing diplomatic relations. Um, but the Americans were already thinking of doing the same thing and weren't really that far behind. It wasn't quite the political uh, diplomatic spat that occurred. Um, and certainly uh, for the kind of youthful protesters on the university campuses and the kind of Pierre Trudeau was still a villain who was in league with the Americans um, in doing terrible things in Vietnam. So the kind of two strands of Canadian kind of thought here. Um, and just to return to the example of Cuba, you know, very famously, of course, Pierre Trudeau travels uh, in, in early 1976 to Cuba, becoming the first NATO uh, leader of a NATO country to do so. 
Um, and this is obviously seen, often seen as a kind of a, an anti-American kind of move. Um, but the Americans, again, took it in stride. And it's actually uh, Gerald Ford, uh, the American president, Nixon's successor, uh, who later in 1976 uh, supports over, over the opposition of the French government, uh, Canada's participation in a group of seven countries. So if there was anger in the, in the White House about here today traveling to Cuba, uh, Gerald Ford certainly didn't let him prevent, for instance, this, this sort of cooperation um, and viewing Canada as a kind of a helpful country. So um, all that's to say is, you know, my talk was kind of over in the 1970s. Um, it was kind of the, the time period I was given, I think. But anyway, the, the idea of this kind of Cold War consensus kind of coming to an end um, doesn't really, and maybe we can talk in the questions about, um, you know, later on. Uh, but certainly we see some of these strands um, just as a way of summing up, some of these strands kind of today, the, the Biden administration, um, you know, 28, I think 29 uh, American senators uh, putting great pressure over the last uh, few months on Canada to increase, for instance, defense spending, to do more to meet its fundamental commitments to continental defense, to NATO, um, you know, in, in the kind of uh, pressure that the Americans were placed on Canada in the 40s and 50s, this sense of commitment. Um, and under Mr. Trump, of course, he, he, uh, he's, he's, he's a bit more forceful in his uh, rhetoric about these kinds of issues. But we can talk about that later. So perhaps some questions. Thanks very much. Well, it's interesting to see that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. McCurcher, for your presentation on this uh, on this timely topic. And um, having read both your books, um, it's an area of Cold War history that um, I I was not well versed uh, in myself. Um, but it was great to 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 do, especially from the survey that you gave, and then going through and seeing all the different um, facets of the relationship that's between it. It was. Uh, it was it was great to see you and uh, Dr. Stevenson what you put together, um, and it's very informative. And I recommend everybody uh, go out and uh, and and take a look at the book. Um, and I was I was thinking about in terms of that relationship and how um, Eisenhower had this affinity for Canada that he mentioned often uh, whenever he was with other leaders and in Canada itself. And the one quote that I picked out was early on in your book about um, I believe he was in the United Kingdom, and it was. Here's a border more than 3,000 miles long that's defended by nothing but friendship. There's not a gun or fort along it. This is the kind of thing that I think we must all strive to achieve, whether we are geographical neighbors or not. So I thought that was very good words with it. And also it was interesting that you brought up uh, Dr. Cook's recent book about Canada-U.S. relationship, relationship uh, during the Second World War. Um, I'm on the final two chapters, and it's interesting you're talking about resources because I was just doing um, – I, uh, I was just listening to – um, the mining of uranium and how that that carried forward into the the Cold War and how that ended up um, affecting the balance of the relationship and um, yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of our, our site specifically, I was fascinated by the third chapter talking about nuclear anxieties and and defense uh, that was within it. So uh, I'm actually a native of North Bay, Ontario. So <laughs> so I, I grew up with that history and uh, you're very I, much I, at the center of nuclear history uh, that, in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, growing up. I used to I used to ride my bike on the waterfront, and they had uh, a model of the the Bullmark missile that was up on a pedestal that uh, that was out there. So uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a fascinating aspect of it. So a reminder to those who have entered the talk late, you can enter your questions to meetings Diefenbunker uh, in the chat to ask our presenter, well, to ask Dr. McCurcher a question. Uh, I have a few thoughts I just wanted to bring up before we introduce questions from the audience. So Dr. McCurcher, what? What is something we can point to today in the Canada-U.S. relationship that has persisted since the beginning of the Cold War, and why has it had such lasting power in successive governments on both sides of the border? Um, I guess the sense of cooperation, um, whether that's uh, you know through the United Nations or through NATO or you know defense cooperation or something, um, that sense of cooperation rather than uh, you know, confrontation, I guess, has been a kind of a in the idea that Canadians and Americans can can you know better kind of suited to working together rather than than you know in, in in conflict has really been a key kind of thing. Again, you know it's not true that we haven't had an undefended border with the United States, but we have had a huge amount of um, you know from border control to obviously not you know continental defense. You know we've had a lot of of cooperation between the two countries. A lot of kind of interdependence has developed, um, which is pretty remarkable when you look at a lot of other places in the world where where they do have armed borders in, 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 a, in a terrible kind of way. Um, now, obviously, since particularly since September 11th, uh, you know there's been, been some hardening of the border, let's say, um, and uh, and certainly you know I don't know that sounds 
too presentist, I guess. But you know, if Mr. Trump plans to wins and plans to deport tens of millions or millions of Americans who are, are living illegally, um, you know, border control could become a big, a, a big, big issue or something. So, um, but that sense again of cooperation has been something um, that's really remarkable with the Canada's relationship um, going right back, I guess, to the to the Second World War. Yeah. And um, so informed by your research and your understanding of the period, um, say you're in a room with um, the two leaders, you know, the new one that's going to come in in November or in, in January, rather, um, and, and the Canadian prime minister. Um, so informed by your research, what is the biggest lesson that Canadian and American leaders today can learn from this period to strive for a strong working relationship between both nations? Um, well, I would suggest that, you know, the, the Canadian leader, um, you know, do more, uh, do more to show the Americans that we are not a weak country, that we are a country that can be counted on to meet our commitments. Um, you know, the NATO 2% target is a kind of a figment of imagination, but it also is real in the sense that it, 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 it matters. Um, you know, we, we're a country that talks a lot, but seldom puts, puts the money up. We haven't certainly for many decades, that's been the case. Um, and so that we need to make the Americans, you know, not view us in, in such, as such a, a weak kind of country. And that was one of the lessons, you know, that Mackenzie King and St. Laurent and, and Lester Pearson, and even John DeFumaker kind of took to heart that Canada needed to kind of put up or shut up, I guess. Um, for the Canadians or for the Americans, I should say it, it's, you know, Canada shouldn't be taken for granted. That's the kind of standard advice that most Canadian prime ministers give to their presidents. Um, and the Americans, I'm sure, roll their eyes at it. But this idea that we shouldn't be taken for granted, we shouldn't, we're not pushovers. Um, we're a country that, that is different from the United States, that has its own interests, has its own politics. Um, um, and that uh, we shouldn't just be expected to fall in line because we, 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 we can differ. We have differed in the past on a whole variety of things. And um, just as a couple of follow-ups, as I was listening to you, I wrote down a few more questions just out of curiosity. So uh, mainly focusing on on the political aspect of it, but um, one thing that I, I'm thinking of just being cognizant of the audience, is there anything that you noticed in your research from a cultural perspective? So during the same period, how two leaders looked at each other, um, how did Canadian and American populations see each other in the same period? And what are the hallmarks of that evolution? Like, what do you see in the history that we can relate to today uh, over that same period of time as Canadians and Americans? Sure. Uh, I mean, the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s are a period where, at least in the way the historians kind of write about this, it's partly there's this kind of growing sense of nationalism and nation on the part of Canadians. Um, you know, we're free of the British Empire, if you like. We're kind of becoming a you know a more modern country. There's kind of a post-war population boom and prosperity and other kinds of things. Um, but that's also occurring under the shadow of the Americans. And so it's this kind of sense of Canadian nationalism, but also a, a fear of American culture, you know, toys and uh, video games, or not video games, but uh, TV shows and radio shows and uh, you know, music on the jukebox. I'm trying to think of the you know, 50s things. Anyway, um, uh, um, but at the same time, a lot of Canadians obviously are attracted to American culture, attracted to American, not American, drive American automobiles, want to read about Captain America, you know, so it's this kind of push and pull that's a part of Canadian culture. We we want to be ourselves, but we're also living next to this huge uh, economic and cultural kind of behemoth. And so those kinds of um, strands of pulling at, at Canadian identity right up to today. Um, um, and obviously there's a lot of fear from the 1960s onwards in particular, um, about kind of American domination. So we see that in the kind of 60s popular imagination. We think of the, you know, I think you had Cold War songs, the previous presentation, but, you know, the Guess Who's American Woman, um, you know, it was a very anti-American song, I guess, from, from the, 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 to the lyrics. Uh, the writing of Margaret Atwood, you know, from the 60s onwards is very kind of, uh, there's a wonderful poem she wrote called Cowboy Addresses Backdrop. Uh, the American Cowboy at Canada as being a kind of a, a supine kind of a backdrop to to this huge bluff cowboy shooting bathtubs full of bullets. I'm trying to remember the lyrics to the poem or the poem anyway. Um, you know, so this these kind of anti-American strands really become a huge part of Canadian culture amongst the kind of baby boomers in the 60s and 70s. At the same time, of course, many of them are are listening to American music and they're protesting. What are they protesting? The Vietnam War, an American war, in the same way that Americans are protesting the Vietnam War and they're protesting the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, and ignoring, for instance, you know, the plight of Indigenous people and, and you know, racialized people in Canada. They're far more interested in what's going on in Selma um, than they are, say, in Africville, 
in, in Nova Scotia. So, um, you know, the dominance of American culture, even in, in the protest movements of the 60s and 70s, is, 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 a, is a potent kind of thing. Because that's um, in our in our gallery four of our Canada and the Cold War, we really uh, lean into that and talk about that aspect mm-hmm. of history because we want people to 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 think about that during this period. It's that interrogation of Canadian identity, you know, who is a Canadian? And um, one of the interesting um, sections that I remember reading about was about the Massey Commission mm-hmm. um, in, in the 1950s and how it was that same interrogation early on about, uh, you know, what is it that people are, are taking in from down south and uh, having that identity. There's a, um, a wonderful quote from the Massey Commission in 1951. Uh, you know, Hollywood refashions us in its own image. Kind of amazing thing. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and and just another one from uh, my perspective as as somebody who's working within uh, a, a you know a construct of civil defense within within Canada. You know, the the Diefenbaker itself uh, constructed from that. Um, in your research with uh, the political discussions and government discussions, was there any interplay or any interesting discussions related to civil defense between the two governments of the you know for the people uh for the populations themselves you know other than the focus of something like the strategic air command or norad or um or the dew line like anything about civil defense did that ever come up about the defensive populations um not not that i've noticed but it wasn't really something i was focused on so if it was sort of in a document maybe i kind of glanced over or something but obviously someone like andrew birch would it's far better to talk about the top of that so sorry but yeah that's okay yeah no i thought i'd pose the question um and just from reading the book and just thinking about that push and pull and how the americans were um you know they were start, are on the rise at that point after the following the second world war and into the cold war um i'm going to pose an interesting question um mm-hmm. Does Canadian sovereignty exist in proximity to this relationship? Um, I guess, yeah, it does. Um, I don't know if sovereignty is really a finite, I mean, it's a made-up kind of concept, I guess, it's kind of a finite thing, a uh, quantifiable thing. But, um, you know, we are a small country living next to a big country. If the Americans really felt that much of a threat through our territory, what's really to stop them from flying planes through or flying ships of our coast or even putting boots on the ground if they really had to. I guess nothing really. Um, uh, so that's why, you know, maybe it's a, a polite fiction or something, but things like NORAD were meant to give Canada some control over how you know, the Americans could be deployed over our, our airspace. Um, and that's why you know, it remains in effect relevant to today, even though I think, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, NORAD is perhaps less important from an American perspective because they have things like Northern Command. Um, and for instance, Canada isn't a part of the ballistic missile defense shield. Um, so, you know, maybe it's you know, poor Canada, but, you know, if North Korea attacks, you know, the Americans could shoot down missiles over our territory. I mean, it's without, without us really knowing. I mean, it, 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 it's kind of scary to think about it, but yeah. Yeah, or if balloons come over from the Pacific, from, from China. There you go. <laughs> um, so um, I'm just looking at the chat right now, and uh, a lot of uh, quotes to you about uh, excellent presentation and post presentation chat. Um, a bit long, when... sorry everyone. No, no, no story, it's the strange long winded. So. No, no, it's it's perfect. Um, and one about uh, great discussion. Thank you very much. I was a communications research operator for the Canadian Armed Forces in te- intercepting intelligence during the Cold War. I find that with these discussions, the knowledge is valuable. And I echo that sentiment. That's the importance of things like the speaker series from the museum. I want to thank Dr. Asa McCurcher once again for their time with us this evening. Uh, Dr. McCurcher, where can people go to follow you and your work? Uh, I have a Twitter or X that I never use, um, or that I rarely use, but I usually use it, uh, to kind of post work that either I'm doing, if I ever use it, not on a daily thing, but if I ever post it, it's to post my own research or those of my, my friends and colleagues. So it's probably maybe a good place. All right. Well, perfect. In there in the chat. Yeah. We posted in the chat for anybody who wants to take note of it. So thank you again, uh, Dr. McCurcher. Um, I highly recommend following up and reading, building a special relationship, Canada, U S relations in the Eisenhower era, 1953, 1961, uh, and Dr. McCurcher's previous publications to learn more about Canada's early cold war relationship with the United States. As we grapple with the topic more widely today in the lead up to the U S presidential election in November, 
So that concludes the event for this evening. Uh, please join us for our final speaker series event of the year on Thursday, November 17th with Dr. Uh, oh, sorry, that's November 14th uh, with Dr. Susan Colburn and their talk, Canada and NATO, Past, Present and Future. I want to thank you all for attending tonight's talk as well as our previous sessions to learn a little more about the Cold War and how its past is still with us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.